All righty, welcome to the Celtics Lab podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Tepetabai. I'm joined by Alex Goldberg and Dr. Justin Quinn. We have basketball to talk about, but because it's the NBA, we have trades to talk about. The trade deadline is February 9th, which means it is rapidly approaching. And to talk about trades later in the podcast, we're going to talk to Jared Weiss of The Athletic. Um, hopefully give us a little bit more of an insight into what the Celtics are up to and a little bit of a window into what um, maybe he's hearing or people of his ilk are hearing. Um, we will also talk about some of the trade proposals that some of our friends over on Twitter offered to us as part of a giveaway that we have been doing. Um, and we'll also tease that Divine Sweater uh, is playing at O'Brien's Pub in Alston on Saturday. And Alex, that show is sold out. It's true. You can no longer purchase tickets online. All of the tickets are gone, but we're really excited to have you all there. Um, this is all um, because of our newest single all the way back. Uh, so even if you can't catch us live on Saturday at O'Brien's, you can still stream the new single on Spotify, Apple Music, SoundCloud, Bandcamp, or just about any other streaming service. And follow us on social media such as Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, etc. for more Divine updates. Cool. And we buried the lead because the biggest update here is that Justin got a standing desk. So now Justin's going to get really fit. Right, Justin? Uh, and the whole 10 minutes a day, I actually stopped sitting. Yeah. Um, I, meanwhile, I'm not in the office for this recording, which means I am surrounded by animals, um, which means YouTube crowd might get to meet Bubbles in a moment if I can wrangle him. But also you might hear meows and barks uh, on top of my wonderful chatter. Anyways, let's talk about the news. Let's talk about some of these trades. And then later, let's talk to Jared. Um, I think since we last talked or we didn't talk much about it, uh, Chris Ford passed away, who was uh, a core member of the Celtics team in the eighties and then a really important coach for the team later in the eighties and into the nineties. Um, so a big part of the Celtics family passed away. Uh, I don't think we've talked about it really on the pod. So our thoughts are obviously with him, um, some of his contemporaries, his family, et cetera. Uh, over to basketball, the Boston Celtics have now lost 36% of their games to Florida teams, thanks to back-to-back losses in Miami and the night before that to Orlando. Prior to that, um, they had a nice win in Toronto and a very nice overtime comeback win against the Warriors, the defending champion Golden State Warriors. Uh, Alex, the good or the bad, whatever you want to talk about, what do you think of this recent stretch of Celtics basketball? So I think I want to put it in context that, yes, the Celtics did lose these back-to-back games against Orlando and against Miami. Um, In both games, the Celtics were not fully healthy, particularly in the Miami game where they were missing Jalen Brown, uh, Marcus Smart, who's been out for both of those games, um, Malcolm Brogdon and Al Horford. Um, So I'm taking those two losses with a little bit of a grain of salt. Now, Miami was also down Jimmy Butler and the Celtics collapsed at the end of that game and what was a pretty winnable scenario for them so definitely some things to be improved and tweaked and kind of modified but overall i look at the kind of most recent stretch uh nine out of the last 11 are wins two losses with somewhat incomplete teams on a back-to-back i'm not super concerned um all things being equal i think the big thing for this team uh that they can kind of glean from this is that um they make hay when they are winning the battle inside for rebounds. And when they lose that battle, it changes the pace and the um, kind of scope of the game pretty dramatically. Uh, And a classic example of that is the win that they had against Golden State, in which they completely dominated the front court uh, of the Warriors and uh, crushed them on the glass. Jason Tatum had 19 rebounds in that game. Uh, Al Horford and Robert Williams were kind of making whatever they wanted to happen happen in the block and just kind of around the rim rebounding is a big thing for this team and one of the kind of big improvements for the celtics this year has been that they have been an elite defensive rebounding team when robert williams is on the floor and they've been improved on the offensive glass from last year if they want to play at their absolute best and beat some of these teams uh that they kind of uh, occasionally fall asleep against the way to do that is to hit the boards and hit them hard that's a good segue, Justin. I was going to tee you up with the following um, that Alex kind of previewed. Um, three losses to Orlando is maybe a fluke, but maybe there's something in the water there. And Orlando is a long, rangy team. Um, do you think there's something about Orlando and maybe something about what Alex was saying about rebounding? Or do you think injuries no, I think he's, bad he's, luck? 
No, he's spot on. There's, there's some structural issues that when the team is faced with longer, uh, it wasn't even really matter if they're athletic because they struggle against Chicago as well. So it's three longer teams. Uh, they really do have trouble uh, against those kinds of opponents, even if they are on paper significantly less talented. Uh, no offense, Orlando fans, if you happen to be listening and that really gets under your skin, uh, you guys are doing great. You're ahead of schedule and you're going to be awesome. <laughs> We're not trying to take a crap on you. But this is the team the best record in the NBA. They should not have lost to the Orlando Magic three times a season, right? So mm-hmm. one of the things, you know, you just – connected to some other things we're going to be talking about today in terms of trades that keeps coming up is the lack of reliable front court depth. Uh, Luke Cornett is great. He has been way better than expected. I think he does deserve, at least in the regular season, a significant role with this team, but I don't trust him. I do not trust him in the playoffs. He can probably, you know, work in a pinch, but even in the regular season, when they really need to get some guys in who can help burn some minutes up and down the entire roster, the front court in particular has been seeing a lot of weight being put on Al Horford in particular, mm-hmm. as well as uh, Rob Williams, who really is still kind of fresh coming back from injury. Uh, so when you put all those things together, plus what Alex is talking about, I really think we are going to see some serious looks at big men, which is something we've been hearing about. Yeah, I think at this point, it doesn't. if, if the Celtics are going to go to the promised land and win four rounds in the playoffs – it is unlikely that Al Horford and Robert Williams are available for all of it, right? Um, one of them is oft injured, and the other is one of the oldest players in the league, uh, increasingly. So the Celtics, quite frankly, needs a starter quality big man. Um, not a, you know, fringe all-star or all-defensive player, but with respect to Luke Cornett, one of my favorite Celtics in a while, and respect to Blake Griffin, neither of those people are starter quality big men. Grant Williams... Uh, it's like increasingly kind of like a wing and a corner pocket specialist. Um, the Celtics and <laughs> Jason Tatum did have 19 rebounds against the Dubs. Um, by far his career high, his previous career high, I think was 15 or 16. Um, I asked him about it. And he just laughed. I mean, it was definitely a one-off. It's not a preview of things to come. It's, this is not Jonas Valanciunas or Steven Adams out there. This was, you know, the ball kept finding him. Um, so I think the Orlando games are a little bit of a one-off, but the Celtics are probably going to have to go through Milwaukee and or Philadelphia. And guess what? Giannis uh, demands your attention at the rim and Joel Embiid demands your attention at the rim. And it's not just that Robert Williams and Al Horford, you know, maybe can't play 40 minutes a game. It's that they might not play any minutes in some of these games. And so the Celtics desperately need a backup big man. Um, and I don't think it's worth freaking out about. Um, but I think uh, this this game in Orlando really put that in stark relief. Alex, to your point against the Heat, they did, you know, let go of the rope. That, that was a game they essentially could have and should have won. Being down five players is no bueno, but it is what it is. All right. Um, Smart is out with an ankle sprain. I don't think we know much about this ankle sprain other than they didn't send him home early on this trip, so that feels encouraging. Um, Rob continues to, like, yeah. He did say he's going to be at one or two weeks. Uh, there's been a lot of okay. speculation about how long that's actually going to be, considering it's the bone bruise that he re-injured uh, from earlier in the season. But it doesn't sound super, super serious. Yeah, agreed. Sure, and uh, Malcolm Brogdon is out with personal reasons. When he comes back, honestly, that, that changes things a lot. If Smart wants to rest until the All-Star break, I'd be cool with that. That's not what's going to happen, um, but I'd be cool with that. Anyways, um, it is a little bit of a a wild set of circumstances. Brockton's out for personal reasons. Smart is injured. Al Horford and Robert Williams are t- taking nights off on back-to-backs. So I don't want to make excuses, but also I don't want to overreact. It's January. Let's get a little bit into the trade rumbles. Jared is going to talk some sense into us, but we can talk about what we've heard or has been widely reported and some of our own thinkings uh, behind them. Um, yeah, now I don't even know what I'm supposed to say. Jakob. Purtle. Purtle. Spelled like P-O- yeah, it's spelled P-O-E-L-T-L. Long time listeners to the show or my students know that I just can't pronounce things and this is my Everest. Okay. Um Jakob, who plays for the Spurs, very reliable veteran big man. Um the Celtics have been tied to him not just this season, but a few times in the recent past. Uh Justin, you reported on this. I mean it wasn't your reporting, but you wrote about this that uh the, the Celtics would consider changing their protections on the pick that they already owe to the Spurs. Can you talk us through that? 
Sure, that was, I think, E.J. Liddell of Spurs Talk. They are a very well-known uh, and reliable source of Spurs insider information. So by itself, it would be credulous alone. But uh, on top of that, the, the rumbles we've been hearing from Shams, which, again, we're going to be talking to Jared about later, uh, they there, there's definitely some fire with that smoke. Uh, there were conversations. If you read very, very carefully, it's not clear when the conversations were leading uh, some credence to some offline conversations we were having uh, where Alex is not buying the, these rumors. Uh, I do think there is a real serious need, as we've discussed, uh, for a big man. But from the reported asking price, it sounds like this removal of uh, the protections is probably something that went along with, you know, like a Peyton Pritchard, Donald Gallinari's uh, uh, contract for salary filler and maybe even an additional uh, first round pick or maybe a collection of seconds, something like that to try to sweeten, sweeten the pot. And it didn't get done if that is the case, uh, which leads me to believe that they really are holding out for two first round picks, uh, probably better than what Boston could add to. Uh, he's not, the Purtle is not the only, uh, he doesn't just have the Celtics looking into him. There's other teams around the league who would definitely use a big man of, of his ilk. So I don't think the price is going to be cheap, uh, which brings us to the question of if the Celtics are not going to do that, which they could, what are they going to do? Sure. Well, let me pause and tell folks that, uh, that maybe 10 days ago at this point, our second to most recent episode, I believe, um, was with Yossi Goslin of Hoops Hype. And we broke down all the minutia of what the Celtics can do. Um, there's a lot about DPEs, disabled player exceptions, the small TPEs they still have, the traded player exceptions. Um, a lot of what comes down to this trade deadline is legalese. Um, so if, if anyone's listening and wondering what is doable or their favorite trade machine is not up to snuff, go listen to that episode because that'll uh, clarify a bunch of things. Um, with that in mind, uh, Willie Hernan Gomez uh, has also been linked to the Celtics. We'll ask Jared about that too. Um, uh, it's also widely reported at this point. Chris Haynes had this as well. I mean, just the news is trickling out that the Celtics are sniffing uh, quite loudly around for a big man. Um, whether that happens is unclear. I think the reporting has also been uh, pretty abundant that Boston will look into the buyout market um, if if that is what ends up happening. Alex, you, you've been on that for a while, that there's just not that many trades out there. And if you open up like just player salaries in the NBA, what fits on a possible uh, Celtics roster, even if they trade Gallo and some more salary, uh, it's just not that inspiring. Um, I posed this in the chats, it's it's more of a thought experiment than anything else. Um, it's a little, they're playing a little dumb. Um, bear with me. Do you think there's any appetite for trading Grant Williams? Um, I'll jump in with that. I don't think so. I think most of the reporting that we've heard is that the Celtics intend to try and re-sign Grant Williams after the season. And the only scenario where I could see them not uh, doing that and moving forward with the trade is if they lose confidence in their ability to re-sign him at a reasonable price point. Um, as it stands this year, I, you know, I think Grant Williams has played pretty well. I think you know, there's been moments where he's contributed pretty nicely to the team overall and I still buy him as a playoff contributor but he hasn't done anything in my mind to really significantly raise his price point past what the Celtics are willing to offer which is around 16 to 18 million by all reports um, that seems like almost exactly the range that they're going to be offering and based on his play I, I would have a hard time seeing other teams offering him that unless they were doing so deliberately to screw with the Celtics uh, at which point it's like all right enjoy grant williams for 21 million dollars um yeah no i i'm kind of i i think grant is in all likelihood going to be on this team uh past the trade deadline yeah i don't think based on what it's looking like in terms of available cap space and how he's being rated in terms of being somewhere in the range of the 20th best free agent uh this summer and a restricted free agent i don't think that you know the teams who do have cap space are going to take you know that kind of a a risk to tie up their available cap space on offer that the Celtics really could match uh but i do agree particularly when you consider the fact that of the people who can credibly guard Giannis Antetokounmpo for more than a few seconds, uh, Grant is one of them. He may not be able to do it better than anyone, but he can do it. 
and he's on this team's roster uh, for an affordable amount of money. And if you have to go through the Bucks, then it, who, are you, who are you going to bring in who is going to be able to fill that role effectively that meshes well with everything else that you would need to do on the team? I don't necessarily – I can't think of one, somebody off the top of my head who's yeah. reasonably available. So, Yeah, the, the reason I ask is uh, in the, the vein of the Celtics feel like they need a backup big man, um, which I don't disagree with at all. Um, because if, you know, if they're out, if Horford goes down for the rest of the season, if Rob goes down for the rest of the season, uh, that's a big, big deal. I mean, it's over. I mean, same if Tatum goes down or Brown goes down, but you know what I mean? Um, and it's also a product of just like what the Celtics could conceivably trade is not that interesting. Uh, the Rui Hachimara trade, the Lakers did maybe reset the trade market, but the trade market is a seller's market right now. People are trying to get two first round picks for quasi quality starters. Um, so Grant is really the only jewel Brad Stevens has to put in his little trade crown. Um, because right now we're looking at like at best a package of Peyton Pritchard, um, Danilo Gallinari, which is it's kind of morally specious and maybe Sam Hauser. And that maybe gets you like $10 million and a first round pick. Um, so at least Grant is an established player to your point, Justin. I mean, he, he proves he can play at the highest level. And if there's a team that wants to exercise what uh, some people call pre-agency as in, you know, get a guy that they can, signed to an extension, um, get his restricted free agency rights. That could be a really interesting piece for a team. I mean, Grant makes less than $4 million, I think. So it doesn't really add to the salary pot that Boston can send out. But it occurs to me that like, if the Celtics want to do a big, big move, Grant or maybe Derek White would be the, the, the piece. I think Brad Stevens has learned his lesson. Yeah. I I think Brad Stevens has also learned his lesson and, uh, the chemistry reigns supreme. I just, Every so often you do come across uh, people, myself included at times, who wants Boston to go all in and make a big time, big time trade, like really shore up the the roster ahead of the postseason. I agree with you, but I do think they already made that trade and that was the Malcolm Brogdon trade. <laughs> yeah, which incidentally was just like an extraordinary trade. I mean, look at what they sent out and how well Brogdon's yeah. been playing. Like with respect to Aaron Neesmith, who's been better than I think we expected. Uh, that, that's a bit of a palace coup for the Celtics. Um, all right. Yeah. That the grant stuff is a thought experiment and more like the logical A to B to C to D starting with point A of like, well, what if the Celtics want to do a big trade is kind of interest you in Peyton Pritchard and uh, rehabbing Danilo Gallinari. Speaking of which, Justin uh, Gallo said that he thinks he'll be available around the postseason. Um, tell us more about that report and then also, or that interview rather. And then also we can talk about whether or not the Celtics would consider trading him. I think if they had to, they would, I don't think that they would blink twice. If somebody like Al or Rob ended up going down, they, they need a big guy in that situation. Uh, they're not going to squander a, a, a playing field this level uh, for feelings. I, they're going to do their best to honor them as much as it doesn't put them in a spot. And so far they've been able to, but as long as they are healthy, I think he's safe. I don't think they're going to trade him. However, uh, in that interview, they did talk about this was with a, I think it was called Around the Game. Uh, it's a Canadian Italian language blog. All you Italian bloggers out there, shoot your shot, get in Galawan. Uh, he seems to like them better than us, you know, gringos over here. Uh, no offense. Uh, to anyone over that word. To gringo. <laughs> a slur. Yeah, no, gringo is not a slur. I just, some people seem to think it is, but, uh, you know, living in Mexico, I've learned it is not a slur. It's just a word referring to people who have the border. Anyway, I digress. Uh, the general sentiment from, from Gallo in that interview was that he thinks that there is a good possibility that he could be back and contribute by the time the playoff the playoffs roll around. Uh, but I, and a lot of people are, are a little skeptical. I do think it's possible what we have seen from other cases of people rehabbing ACLs that are not fully torn. Uh, you know, I am a doctor. I'm not the right kind of doctor to speak on whether that is accurate or not, but it has happened. I don't know if he's going to be one of those cases, but the ramp up period is a significant concern because you can't just, you know, suddenly show up like, Hey, I'm healthy and I'm ready to play playoff basketball because it's like, you think regular season basketball is intense and dangerous. That could be the end of his career if he retires a little bit. And I mean, so the most recent example I can think of of a quote unquote best case scenario is probably Joe Ingles, who's now playing for the Bucks after tearing his ACL and recovering, I think a good bit faster than a lot of people were expecting. But even then, 
Joe Ingles is kind of still in his ramp up period for what it's worth. And he's playing, you know, eight minutes a game tops. Like Mm -hmm. it's in a situation where Gallinari might actually come back by the end of the season. I I think I would be thrilled to see him out there because, you know, I've always really liked his game among other things. But um, for the most part, even if he does come back and he does get through his ramp up period, I have a really hard time seeing him in a significant role for this team, uh, particularly during the playoff run when rotations start to tighten. So to that end, you know, I know that Brad Stevens has changed a lot from the Danny Ainge days. And in general, it seems like he's kind of taking a more player friendly approach to GMing generally. But um, if there's any kind of shade of Danny Ainge style ruthlessness in him, I wouldn't be shocked to see a world where Gallo is on the move if the Celtics deem it, uh, you know, a kind of reasonable expense. Sure. So let's do this. Uh, I'm going to pause the action and do an ad break. And then through the magic of editing, uh, on the other side of that break, we will talk to Jared Weiss of The Athletic about um, all of this trade stuff, as well as get into some of your Twitter trades. And just as an added treat, I might be in a different room <laughs> when, we, uh, when we do that segment. Check out Screen Time, movies, streaming, and everything in between with us, Gary Tangway and Drew Yana. We watch what you watch, so watch us wherever you get your podcasts, or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yeah, and we're pretty easy on the eye. Yeah, no, we're not. Speak for yourself. Screen Time, movies, streaming, and everything in between. We're going to hop into the lab, as we like to call it here. And what we're going to do is, as in a, in a moosh boosh to uh, Jared Weiss of The Athletic, we're going to talk about some of the Twitter uh, replies that we got on our little giveaway and some ideas that um, some of the people out there had. So, Tim, you get first bite of the apple. Uh, common package, Peyton Pritchard and uh, Justin Jackson. Um, and I don't think you had a pick attached to this. You said that he would like to trade for Jalen Williams from Oklahoma City. Um, I assume it's not Santa Clara, Oklahoma, uh, Jalen Williams is the other one. Cause the better Jalen Williams. No, I assume it's not the better one. No, I, don't think, I don't think they're going to trade either of them, honestly, but maybe. Well, I don't think you get the good one for the better one for Pritchard and uh, JJ. Respectfully. Probably not. Respectfully. Regardless. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say both Jalen Williams are athletic and rangy. I would take the, the lesser. Um, they need to come up with a nickname system because it's it's confusing as hell. But anyways, Tim, uh, I love where your head's at. I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of this trade. Um, shout out to Tim. Also, his band in town meeting. Good band. Um, but I, I, I'm a fan of this trade. I think it's potentially a little unrealistic um, in knowing Sam Presti. He's going to ask for some draft compensation for sure. But um, I do think that that's kind of the range that we're looking at as far as realistic Celtics trades go. Um, if we're talking about players that we're going to assemble and move them to packages, Pritchard and Justin Jackson, and then, you know, pick value for a kind of mid to low end role player seems about right. So I, I think you're in the ballpark, Tim. So uh, speaking of which, that same package, um, Stewie Brooklyn, Truther, I think his name, Truther Brooklyn, um, mm-hmm. Wants to know if the Celtics can get their hands on Jared Vanderbilt, which is a very noble target, but I don't think that package is getting it done. Um, J- J- Justin Jackson uh, will probably be traded away to the benefit of taxes, if nothing else, um, like a back scratch favor, but he doesn't really have traded value. Um, although maybe we'll see him playing a little bit more to try to up his value. Um, and Pritchard, I think, is going to be a popular uh here um our friend ben says that there's gonna be no trade which is lovely um anarchy probably pods the right choice. It would be probably the right choice says uh maybe andre drummond i don't think anarchy pod had quite the right package but that's interesting <laughs> um and connor gave us uh Jakob Bertel for fast pp gallo a first in two seconds i wouldn't be surprised if connor might have the most realistic package but let's ask jared about that um so we're going to welcome in Jared Weiss of The Athletic to talk about this trade deadline. Jared Weiss of The Athletic, he is on the road with the Celtics. We're going to ask you, Jared, about all sorts of trade things. But really, really quickly, the story about Joe Mazzulli doing a somersault in front of Marcus Smart to tease him, can you confirm that? 
I was actually not there to bear witness, sadly. I walked through the room right after it happened. So, But Mar- Marcus Smart did confirm that it happened. So we, we, it is it is a fact in reality that Joe Missoula just walked by Marcus Smart in the locker room, saw his guy was injured, couldn't was just not in a position to do any somersault of any kind, any gymnastics of any kind, honestly. He just straight up did a little side somersault and then basically told him to go after himself and then walked away. And that's Joe Missoula in a nutshell. Okay, tremendous. You're not here to talk about that, but I couldn't help myself because uh, that's why I'm here. So, but if you want to throw <laughs> something else, I guess we could do that. Other than all things Luke Cornett, that's by far the funniest thing that's happened this season. Okay, <laughs> um, to the benefit of time, I'm going to swing it to Justin. Justin, take it away. So we do have you on to talk about what you've been hearing about the Celtics. Uh, you wrote about some of this uh, in terms of trades in a piece referring to Shams breaking some interest, uh, not necessarily when the interest was, but some interest uh, in Jakob Pertl. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what you've been hearing on that front? Yeah, so Shams reported that the Celtics and the Raptors were the two teams that had like registered significant interest. The Celtics have been they've been knocking on that hurdle door for a long time. I mean, they managed to get Derek White out of it, which I think they were honestly surprised that they could pull off last year. That seems to have worked out pretty well. Um, and I think that they're looking at this as they have two good centers that they know that they can trust when they're on the floor to be there to be the guys they need. They don't know if we're going to be on the floor. Um, and they need insurance. They they clearly could use a better backup big than Luke Cornett. I think Luke Cornett has done a good job this season, especially for what they're paying him and what their expectations were. Luke Cornett, for the money, has given them – he's done. A, he's had a good season. It's been a good season for Luke Cornett. Blake Griffin hasn't been going that well, um, but, you know, he's really, really useful in specific situations, and obviously Vaughn has gone now. So they do have room to grab another center. I just don't know how they're possibly going to be able to get Jakob Hurdle when there's other teams like Toronto that have a much stronger need for him. Like Toronto would start Jakob Hurdle. He would be a crucial player to that team. Hurdle wouldn't play that much in Boston. Like most, if when on the nights when both Rob and Horford are healthy, you're playing Hurdle like 10 minutes a game at the most, like for the most part, he's not playing that much. So I don't see how they get him because I reported that San Antonio is looking for two first rounders for him. I think Mike Scotto or Jake Fisher also just reported that, or maybe both of them did. Um, so, you know, they're everyone's hearing that around the league at this point. And, you know, the Spurs, they were saying the same thing about Derek White last year. They wanted two first round picks and they wanted, uh, they wanted like another player that they could use on top of that. And they ended up getting something similar to that. Honestly, it might be better than that from the Celtics where they got that top one protected pick swap. Um, so, like they were able to get pretty close, basically exactly what they reasonably could have hoped for for White. Honestly, a lot for White, and so I think they handle the Spur- the Pirtle situation the same way, especially because they can just pay Pirtle. Like they have the financial capability to do it. They are not close to winning, so it doesn't matter if they spend a lot of their money on a guy like Pirtle because they're not. They're probably not going to be signing a big time free agent in the near future. They can tie up their cap space into them. So I, I don't see how the Celtics could possibly get them. I think that's shooting a little too high. Like they're better off getting somebody who's probably on the similar, maybe a little bit better than Cornette and Griffin, but is basically making just a couple million a year. So on that tip, uh, I'm going to swing it away in the interest of time as well, but I just want to get your opinion in a pinch. Do you think there is a reasonable world where Luke Cornette could realistically play significant playoff minutes and this team succeed? Not significant, but I mean, he's probably going to play in the playoffs. Um, I mean, they're gonna they're not gonna want to have Rob or Al take games off or rest or in the playoffs. You don't do that in the postseason, and the schedule doesn't necessitate it. But there's definitely risk that those guys are going to be banged up along the way, especially with the potential for this team to be playing like two months in the playoffs. Like, don't forget, last year's playoff run was two months long. The idea that you're not going to have injuries over the course of two months in extremely grueling games, it's like, yeah, guys are going to be out. It's going to happen. We've seen it every single year. And one of those two guys is going to be out a decent amount. So, like, they're going to need backup center to get minutes. And it's probably not going to be Grant Williams based on the way this year's going. They've been pretty much preferring him at the four. And he's had – it's been an up-and-down season, but when he's been on, he's been really good at the four. So, I, they're going to – they do need another big because he's going to get some run during the playoff. And Luke Cornett, it, like, he's the classic example of a guy who – if they were to use him in the postseason, that's going to be a vulnerability. Teams are just going to be too stacked that they're going to be able to take advantage of him. They're going to put him out in space. 
um, or they're going to post him up. And like, he's a good rim protector against like people attacking, but he's not that great against like actual bigs that can post him up and they can move him under the rim. So that's where it makes sense for them to go and get another center. I just, again, like, I just think Pirtle is just too good for that role. So, yeah, to that end, you know, there have been some other names that uh, might be a little bit closer to realistic expectations for the Celtics backup big man spot. One that's popped up recently, according to Bobby Marks, is Willie Hernan Gomez. Um, There's a little bit of smoke there that he might be available for maybe some second round picks for something like that. I'm curious, what have you heard, Jared, on the Willie Hernan Gomez front? So I, I miss Bobby Marks reporting that. Did, did Bobby Marks actually report that? Did he just like, did he like uh, say like that's an he idea? He suggested that it in yeah, his sorry. Kind of trade guide. So your report who said there was interest. So um, like who, who said there was interest? Your hoops. Yeah, okay, yeah. So from what I saw, so when we were in Toronto, there was a reporter from Deportivo who was asking Joe Mazzula about it. And I was like, that's interesting. You're not supposed to ask a coach about a guy that you might want. And obviously, Missoula was like, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, and then another uh, reporter, another uh, European, I think, reporter, Atlanta reporter last night in Miami asked another question about Willie Hernan Gomez. And PR literally shut it down before Marcus Smart could even answer it because obviously it's like, he's not going to yeah. answer that. But so I don't, I'm not sure 100% if the guy that asked the question in Toronto was the person that reported the Hernan Gomez news for Deportivo. Um, but I think that he apparently has some sources, I would presume, with Hernan Gomez to decide. Uh, obviously, if it's got a report coming out of Spain and Hernan Gomez is Spanish. So I'm guessing that there's something coming out of Hernan Gomez's camp suggesting that the Celtics would be one of the teams that are interested. And it makes perfect sense. Like He's the exact kind of center we're talking about. I'm not sure if he's better than Luke Cornett at this point of his career, but he's a solid you know, rotation big. He's, he's the kind of guy that... He doesn't really play a ton, but he still keeps sticking around the league anyway. So he's the exact kind of player you can see them giving up like a protected second rounder in cash considerations for. Um, there are some other players to keep on the radar. Uh, we can throw a couple of names out there. Um, some of these would be maybe reunions with the Celtics, looking at wing depth, another area they might address. Uh, Javante Green and Josh Richardson have both been batted around. I guess I'm curious more so just do you think that wing depth is another area that the Celtics will be looking at in terms of bolstering at the trade deadline? Yeah, so like the bit, the biggest, the biggest need as far as dealing with health issues, but as far as the like actual pieces to squeeze into this rotation that they don't have right now, I think that's the top one. Is like just like an athletic wing who can play above the rim that can give them rebounding when they, that can give them like length at the point of attack when they need it. And so Javante Green, I love that idea. If they can manage to get him, like he's a he's a good player and they love him there. JT is really good friends with him. He's very popular in the locker room. Um, so that would be great. Um, the other name that you said, sorry, I forgot. Who was the other name again? Richardson. Thank you, Richardson. That's right. I was like, I know someone's. Um, so I would be shocked if Jay Rich wanted to come back here. Um, I, I, I kind of come back to Boston. I think he really needs his reps. He's looking for his minutes. They already traded him away, feeling like he wasn't the right fit for what they were trying to do. So, like, it just, like, he, he does do some of the stuff that they would be looking for, but I don't think he's quite – uh, what they need at this point although he is a decent ball handler and scorer which is something they could definitely use more of i just feel like they probably are better off getting like a point guard that could step in in situations like they had last night where they just that that's really needed someone who could really dribble the trade and score or kick it out and so i think that's probably uh, more likely to go for that kind of player so we'll wrap on this one. Um, based on just kind of what you're hearing and, you know, buzz around the Celtics trading facility and all of that stuff, um, what would you put odds at for a big splash, a mid-sized move, or a small move for the Celtics trade deadline? Which one of those do you think is more likely to happen? Big splash seems very unlikely. Why do that? You have the best record in the NBA. Um, it's working. Uh, mid splash would be surprised. I, I really think that it's going to be a pebble dropping in the ocean. There's going to be a small ripple. That's just, it's just like they don't need to do much to change the way this team is composed. Their future financial outlook is relatively stable. They don't really need to do much. Like they just, they just extended Orford. I don't think they have that many problems to solve. Their problems are pretty small. Their problems are if they're missing five players, they're probably not going to win. I think that's a problem most teams in the NBA would have. Um, and then, like, yeah, they could be a little bit more, they can play above the rim a little bit better. And they could have like another super high quality playmaker that that pot, that possibly could solve some of their problems. But they're a great team. It ain't broke. They don't need to fix anything. 
Makes sense to me. Anything left for you, Cam? Well, I'll just point out that um, at times in his career, Carmelo Anthony has been a great rebounder. Um, no, so Jared, exactly. Jared, that might be the way that you are identifying. Um, I right, Jared. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll just say I'll just say Mello. Like I was hearing plenty of rumblings back in like November that Mello was approaching making his, like, joining a team, and it still hasn't happened. So I haven't got an update on that. Uh, I just I don't think Mello is what they're looking for. Um, but I, they definitely could use another spot up shooter that they could rely upon. Just they need they need defensive effort. And like Hauser is he hasn't been consistent shooting the ball. But and he gets like his length and his and his physicality. It really leaves him vulnerable a lot of the time on defense. But he works like that yeah. dude puts in the effort, and that's why like I, I somebody commented on my story today saying like it's, it's clearly time to Brad Stevens to give up on the Hauser experiment. I was like, bro, he's played seventy games in his career. <laughs> he's barely, he's like he's, he's a baby. Give him time. He'll be okay. Yeah, between Pritchard Hauser and Cornette, maybe there was an upgrade to be made, and maybe also we'll get a new, you know, person to hang in the Celtics mythology uh, suite of banners because there might be a hero out there. Um, Jerry, you got to fight. I do, but I'm doing some stupid TSA stuff. So before I do that, I just want to make one more point before I lose you guys. That um, you know, people, great. people that yeah, welcome to the Miami airport, everyone. So people that want to make trades have to remember that they just made two big trades already last year. They already gave up two first-round picks and then committed to a big swap on the third pick. So, like, they've already made the roster-building moves. There's not much more roster-building. There, there's no more roster-building to be done. There's just a little bit of refinement around the edges. But why, like, they, they don't need to make a move. And I think people are so conditioned to the idea that it's a transaction window, so they have to do something. They don't. They have an open roster spot already. They know that they're going to probably sign someone at some point. So you will get your fun new player that I will try to do some sort of profile on, some sort of weird proclivity they have that people will forget about in two months. But I like you have to love the team the way it is. It's a yeah. great team. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think a, a loss in Miami, a loss in Orlando, undo a lot of great team building. Um, all right, Jared Weiss of The Athletic. I'm sure our listeners know where to find you. But um, as always, Miami Airport. Coming. Miami <laughs> Airport, evidently. Um, All right, thank yeah. you, fellas.